Welcome to Reformation Sunday Worship at Westminster and to our inclusive family of faith. We especially welcome our visitors and those joining us on YouTube. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Thank you for not calling me Miss Brooklyn this time. Where does it say Brooklyn? Oh, yeah. Brooklyn. Miss Brooklyn is Sabbathing and camping with her family today. Isn't that a good thing to do? It's okay, Cohen. Do you remember what a good job our kids did last week talking about being God being stuck, stuck on, do you remember what do we say, Ollie? God is stuck on me and God is stuck on you. That's right. Now, that begs a question today. Do you think there's anybody God can't be stuck to? What do you think, Ollie? Yeah, you can ask a question. Oh, we'll get to this in just a minute. If your question's about this, can we wait one minute? Because I know you're really interested in that. Yeah, that's a mohawk. We'll talk about that Lego guy in just a minute. What do you think? Can God be stuck to the president? Yes. What if we don't like the president? Yes. Okay. What about Kang the Conqueror? Can God be stuck to him? No. Yeah? Oh, we got a yes and a no. Hmm. What about your really mean teacher at school? Can God be stuck? Oh, you don't have any mean teachers. Well, how about that? What about those really mean kids at school whose sole purpose in life seems to make yours miserable? Is God stuck on them too? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. So the church in the past... Oh, well, that's not very nice. Do you think God can be stuck to him? 
No. Oh, oh. Well, Ollie, that, um, so the church in the past and some people today have thought that some people weren't good enough or had made too many mistakes for God to stick to them. Yeah. They told that people, they couldn't be part of the church. They couldn't be part of the Jewish fellowship. Um, they couldn't be part um, because maybe their job or their race or their sexual orientation, people left them out and said, God doesn't, can't stick to you. You're not sticky enough. But do you think we get to choose who God sticks to or does God choose? God? What do you think? Is that up to us? Or does God choose us? God chooses who to stick to, right? So today's Bible story, Michael helped make this awesome Lego representation. Today's Bible story tells of a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, who climbed up in a tree. Do you see the guy in the tree? Yeah. Do you know what his name was? Zacchaeus, that's right. Why, do you know why he climbed up in the tree? Did he just like climbing trees? No, because he was short. Because he was short. And who did he want to see? God. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus had come to town. And see all those people who had come to see Jesus? There's even one with a cape and a beard. There's one with a mohawk. Um, yeah, there's all, all kinds of people came to see Jesus. Now, some people in town said Zacchaeus couldn't be part of them. They said that God wouldn't stick on someone who had a job like he did. But do you know what Jesus did? Do you know what Jesus did to Zacchaeus? He made him tall. Nope. He loved him as he was. He asked him to dinner. He said, I'm coming to your house for dinner. Out of all of those people there, Jesus picked the one who they said... God doesn't love. So I wonder, do you think we can have eyes like Jesus? Yeah. When you look around school or your soccer team or dance or orchestra or band, church, who do people say can't know God? And can you see Jesus in them? Ollie, can you see Jesus even in the boys who call you names? Look for Jesus, look for God in them too. You don't? Well, that's why we need God's help. So let's pray to God for help with that, okay? Dear God, Dear God help, us see the invisible help us see the invisible with your eyes. Remind us that Jesus can see the best in us and draw out the best in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may the Spirit of God rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. Amen. Our epistle reading today is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 21. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, God. 
going down, Zacchaeus, from that sycamore. Jesus comes to give you life forevermore. If you truly would see him, open your heart. He will come today. He will come to stay. If you truly would see him, open your heart. He will come today. He will come to stay. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Listen to this. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome Jesus. Now all who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. So as we wrap up our Lego series, I want to go back to something I mentioned several weeks ago. Lego Masters is a network TV reality show where master Lego builders compete in a variety of time-restricted challenges. Here's a sampling of a few things they've created on the show. Um, this is Jaws. Yeah, that's right, Cohen. This is Spaceland, and you know that that actually worked, right? The, the roller coaster, the Ferris wheel, that's what it's called. Um, we have an alien, and can you kind of see, and the tentacles actually moved on that one. Um, and then a warden of the woods. And again, look at the size of these creations compared to their creators. Um, they are beautiful and detailed and creative. And they're given parameters or themes for each build, but it's a remarkable display of creativity and imagination. As I entered this generation of Lego through my children, I was worried about that at first with the exact pre-printed instruction manuals. Would Lego stimulate their imagination like it did mine? But then I saw what my boys did once they had created each set the way they made each build their own, customizing each piece according to their imagination. One of the gifts of Lego is that it sets the imagination free to create things of this world and not of this world, to set ourselves in the world of the creator and see what gifts lay just beyond. In Lego and in following Jesus Christ, imagination is encouraged. We see both that imagination and the lack of it in our gospel story this morning. Jesus is reaching the end of his journey to Jerusalem, as Luke tells it, arriving in the border town of Jericho with a crowd following him and a crowd meeting him in town, gathering to see what he might teach and do next. He had just restored sight to a blind man begging by the side of the road, a blind man who could see that he was the merciful Savior. 
Now he enters a new place surrounded by what I'm sure are many upstanding and faithful citizens. But his eyes are drawn not to them. Instead, his eyes are drawn up to the branches of a sycamore tree where short Zacchaeus had climbed up to get a look at this radical teacher and leader. Now, if you heard the reading carefully this morning, Zacchaeus wasn't just any old tax collector. He was a chief tax collector, supervising others, taking money from people. In a time when the Romans oppressed the Jewish people, tax collectors worked for the Romans to not only collect the taxes due to the empire, but also padding their pockets along the way. Thus, when a Jewish person became a tax collector like Zacchaeus, he was ostracized from the faith community as though he were a Gentile. And so it's to everyone's surprise that Jesus calls up to the man in the tree by name, Zacchaeus, come on down. You can almost see his frantic little face when he realizes Jesus is talking to him and hurriedly crawls down that tree, trying not to fall, thrilled that the one he had been so desperate to see had seen and chosen him. But not everyone was happy with Jesus' choice of association. The crowd grumbles at Jesus' choice. It's that same word, that same sort of grumbling against Moses by his people in the wilderness. How could Jesus choose him? Doesn't he know what sort of person he is? Who would voluntarily hang out with this man that we have intentionally set outside the circle of respectability? The failure of the crowd is a failure of imagination. They look down on Zacchaeus, not just literally, but metaphorically too. They couldn't imagine that Zacchaeus, a traitor to their own kind, could be redeemed. They couldn't imagine that Jesus, a faithful Jewish rabbi, would have anything to do with one who would rob his own people. They couldn't imagine that one who would be set outside their religious fellowship would then be named by Jesus a son of Abraham. They couldn't imagine that the one who created the breach could also be the one to repair it. They couldn't imagine reparations, not two times, not three times, but four times what was taken. They couldn't imagine a different way of living, a different way of moving through the world. As we celebrate Reformation Sunday this morning, it's the 505th anniversary tomorrow of the publication of Martin Luther's 95 Theses, on the door of the church in Wittenberg that we acknowledge as the start of the Protestant Reformation. On this day, we both give thanks for the spirit movement in the church as well as lament the ways that we have not moved with God. For we know that the failure of this crowd to imagine something different is our failure too. Again and again, the church has failed to see beyond what there is to what could be. Again and again, the church has preferred to set boundaries that leave some outside rather than imagining a love of God that's big enough for all. We grieve when we think of times we have grumbled like this crowd at the grace of God being maybe more expansive than we'd really like. But Martin and Katharina Luther, Jean Calvin... Jean Knox, Argela von Grumbach, Ulrich Zwingli, and Marguerite de Navarre followed the word and the spirit of God to something else. These Reformation leaders followed Jesus to create and build a church anew from their sanctified imaginations, allowing the church to be born again. They gave away so much of their security, sometimes their profession, 
in order to follow Jesus into this new venture called the Reformed Church. And when we think about remarkable Reformation leaders, when we think about powerful leaders in our own time, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or Fannie Lou Hamer, one thing they share is a vision that the world could be different. They were not satisfied with the status quo, with how things had always been done. Instead, they rooted themselves in God's word and opened themselves to the working of the Spirit so that the vision might be bigger, that God's sanctified imagination can become a reality. Because according to the letter to Ephesians that we heard Judy read this morning, God, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. Abundantly far more than all we can imagine. That's God. That's God in Jesus Christ who saw that wee little man. You see, Jesus' imagination has been on display in the Gospel of Luke from the very beginning. As the Reverend Sharon Wrench says in her commentary on Luke, the gospel has been full of the stories of Jesus' presence on the margins of society, reaching out to those whom sin, illness, lifestyle, or the disintegration of their personalities has made into non-persons. That role has not been coincidental. It is central to Jesus' identity and mission from God. This seeing people who everyone else don't, doesn't want to see, this is not a side quest for Jesus. This is not a hobby. Breaking open the imaginations of his followers and the crowds is in fact a key component for the Son of Man who has come to seek and save the lost. And it's his very present that transforms Zacchaeus a son of Abraham, a child of God, one who was worthy of Christ's presence. His declaration of reparations was not to earn that identity, but to reveal it, to show what Jesus had seen in him in that sycamore tree. Jesus saw him exactly for who he was, but also for who he could be as part of God's chosen people. Jesus envisioned a different future for Zacchaeus, and not just for him, but for everyone who had been defrauded or taken advantage of. Jesus imagined a new world where no one is beyond redemption, where it's never too late to turn around and start anew. And that radical act of being seen by Jesus, of being in the presence of the Christ, allowed Zacchaeus' own imagination to take flight. Maybe he didn't have to stay home from the synagogue. Maybe he didn't have to do what all the other chief tax collectors did. Maybe he didn't have to extend the empire's oppression. Maybe instead he could be something else a liberator, an encourager, an equipper, a restorer, a repairer of the breach. With Jesus in the picture, possibilities open up. Zacchaeus gives away half his wealth to the poor, previously unthinkable, unimaginable. Zacchaeus pays back how many times in reparations? Four times. That's beyond most of our imaginations. With Jesus in our lives, generosity is the response to grumbling. Boldly living is the response to boldly being so loved and seen. With Jesus in our lives, salvation doesn't just come to us individually, but it comes to all our house, filling the space around us. With the presence of Jesus comes the presence of salvation of imagination encouraged, of impossibilities becoming possible. Have you ever been limited by other people's imaginations? Have you ever been put in a box with a label that didn't quite seem to fit? Has someone ever said that you're the worst person for the job, although it turns out you were actually the best? 
I remember kicking a soccer ball around in Northern Ireland when I was 16. A little neighbor boy walked out and said, girls can't play football. I was playing it. Or another time after I officiated a funeral, a man came out and shook my hand. I don't believe in lady preachers, he said, but you did a good job. <laughs> both, both that Irish little boy and that Kansas man were lacking in imagination in what God can do. Maybe it's your own imagination that's been limited. That you couldn't see a future where you were healed or not in pain. Maybe you couldn't see a future where you were reunited with someone estranged. Maybe you couldn't see a future that it was just something too far gone for God to revive and redeem. Jesus and Zacchaeus are here to tell you this morning, it doesn't have to be that way. With Christ's presence here, salvation has come to us all again and again. And that's our challenge as a church, to live out that salvation with grace and gratitude, to encourage others' imaginations, to show them what is possible with God. We are a small church of 200 people, and there are those who would use that to limit our ministries and our imagination. But who are they to say what we can and can't do? Could we give a gift to every single Swift Elementary student? Yes. Yes. Can we feed over 2,000 AISD students every week? Yes. yes. Can we forgive over $4 million in medical debt to Texans? Can we remain connected in an increasingly isolated world? Yes. Can we build intergenerational relationships in a partitioned society? Yes. Can we have a resurrection and a fresh start for the church in America? Yes. Can we desegregate the most segregated hour in America, 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings? Can we? By the grace of God. So here's, here's a little story of what this looks like. Um, this is probably true for most of you all as well, but the stock market losses this year has hit our church savings pretty hard. We're running a $10,000 or so deficit of income to expenses right now. And a failure of imagination would tell us to rein it in, to circle the wagons. But the imagination God gives us is so much bigger the generosity of this congregation is so much more. The possibilities with Christ present is bigger than our fear. Roland Phipps emailed me the other day to say that he had gotten an unusual request from Presbyterian Children's Homes and Services in anticipation of our annual Christmas toy drive to bring toys and gift cards for kids in foster care. One foster teen needed a full-size mattress. Well, would that be possible? A failure of imagination would have said, no, not this year, not, not when we're running low on funds. A failure of imagination would have said, you know, that insurance bill we just got was really big. But instead, God's imagination connected us with Reverend Miranda Trussell's husband and the nonprofit he helps run. Could they maybe provide a full-size mattress for this team? Of course, he answered. You see how this works? Our imagination has got to be bigger than a grumbling crowd would allow. Jesus has been building his disciples and building us up brick by brick, encouraging them that missing pieces matter and that they need to build their ministry well and that God will be stuck on them no matter what. And for all of those to be true, he needed to ignite their imagination and he needs to ignite ours to see not just what is, but what could be. So friends, open your eyes, open your heart, open your minds. Let God's possibilities rise up in you. 
Know that in your efforts to see Jesus, he will see you too and call you by name and leave you totally changed. Let us build together not just Lego, but the vision of God's kingdom. Thanks be to God for the gift of imagination. Amen.
out into the world, have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people, serving and rejoicing in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, who sees even us. Amen. Amen.